I'd now like to ask Brent Scowcroft to join me. That was quite a visio. Henry hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> Introducing Henry Kissinger is a ritual. And I don't know how many occasions I've been when Henry has been introduced. But it usually starts out by saying, whoever it is, here is a man who needs no introduction. Wrong. You are the ones who don't need an introduction. Henry not only needs it, he enjoys the longer, the more endearing, and so on. Seriously, one of the most treasured parts of my life is the opportunity I've had to work with Henry Kissinger. He is a remarkable individual. This was the start of a career whose brilliance is almost impossible to replicate. You know, the term strategy is one of the most overused words in the English language. It means everything to everybody. But if there is a strategist in the United States, it is Henry Kissinger. Because he had the ability, and I watched it, he would, we would have a strategy toward country X, country Y, country Z, so on and so forth. Each one individually tailored to the idiosyncrasies of that. But they would all be tailored so that the individual strategies accumulated together in a national strategy which advanced the interests of the United States. That is a remarkable kind of person. Most secretaries of state, let alone the only man who was secretary of state and national security advisor in the United States, peak about the time they leave office and then gradually decline in interest and focus by the American public, or by the world public, if you will. That's not the case with Henry Kissinger. My estimate is he is far better known now than he was when he left office as Secretary of State. Uh, the little I know I learned from him, even that sleep is a desirable function, not a necessity. <laughs> and I learned that one well. Anyway, I give you one of America's great treasures, Henry A. Kissinger. Brent, and ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> President Nixon has been invoked here quite often, 
And I want to tell you a warning he gave me whenever I told him I was going to make a speech. He said, don't use these four-syllable Harvard words because your audience will think you're talking about a soft drink. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to say a few words about some of the people who are here tonight. Brent and I went through a lot together. First of all, anyone who worked with me for a number of years and still talks to me <laughs> is a man of true spiritual quality. Uh, but we went together through the period when, due to our domestic divisions, the authority of the president dwindled for a number of years, and to maintain the position of the United States with a president who nevertheless, with all his travails, showed extraordinary courage and determination, will always be one of the signal experiences. And tonight, too, General Boyd is here, who's going to take over as chairman, who was in Vietnam as a prisoner of war and has had been an inspiration to all of us who knew him. And before the end of my remarks, which will be just before breakfast, I will introduce uh, Hank, uh, Hank Greenberg. Uh, this is the only country in which being called a realist is a criticism. <laughs> and uh, The task of foreign policy leaders is to take their society from where it is to where it has not been before, in an environment in which not all the other components have an identical view. President Nixon used to have a maxim, which was, you pay the same price for doing something halfway as for doing it completely. So he didn't believe he'd spent days and weeks analyzing a problem. But once he made a decision, he was inexorable in carrying it out. Now, America is in a period that is unique in our history. We had 150 years, nearly 200 years, of being able to afford being separated from the rest of the world. And to believe that whether we participated in international affairs or not was our choice because our margin of survival was so great that we could wait until dangers became nearly overwhelming. But since the end of World War II, and increasingly in the past decades, 
we are living in a world in which a great deal depends on our judgment of where we find ourselves and about our vision of where we want to go. We live in a world in which a number of different perceptions of world order exist side by side. There's the European view, which rejects much of its historical experience of its internal balance of power, and maybe some of its previous commitments to the use of force. There is the Asian situation, which is comparable to Europe in the 19th century, where the various states are still thinking in terms of equilibrium with each other. And there's the Middle East, which is comparable to Europe in the Thirty Years' War as an ideological conflict. And all these worlds are occurring simultaneously. When we talk about world order, we think that there is a uniform view in the world. But when we think of the countries with which we have to deal, there is a huge cultural difference. For one thing, many of the key countries I'd say all the key countries have always had powerful neighbors. We've never had powerful neighbors. If I compare the view of China, the view of Americans, Americans think every problem has a solution. And that solution can be achieved in a finite time. The, Chin the Chinese ambassador may correct me, but in my observation, I think Chinese do not believe that any problem has a final solution. That every solution is an admissions ticket to another set of problems. And so, we always have programs, and the Chinese have concepts, and how to bring these together. We, as I said, have never had powerful enemies at our borders. Russia has never been without powerful enemies at its, all its borders. So the perception of a society that has been devastated in a number of wars and then had to reconstitute its system again in recent decades, it's bound to have a different perspective from ours. So for the designers of American foreign policy, it isn't important alone to know what they want. It's important to understand the perception of themselves, of other societies, because that will determine the range of the possible. Foreign policy has been described as the art of the possible. And uh, that is bounded by the convictions of one's own society and the convictions of other countries with which one has to deal. If one operates 
Beyond that framework, one suffers shipwreck. If one operates too much on the familiar, one is doomed to stagnation. How to determine the right scope of foreign policy is the first task that any foreign policy designer has to start with. So when we talk about realism here, we're not talking about power against idealism. That's the simple view. And it's the view of people who think that the foreign policy is either an exercise in psychiatry or an exercise in theology an exercise in trying to convince others of your good intentions, or an exercise of forcing others or impelling others into your uh, view. Realistic foreign policy attempts to define the mix between the necessary power without which there can be no security. And the necessary ideals without which a society cannot sustain sacrifices. And without sacrifices, you cannot build for the future. So if I look at the decades, some of us have lived through. There is this experience of the wars America has been engaged in. Wars which we ended with great public support and great idealism and within a finite period Questions arose, and as the war continued, the country became divided on the issue, so that the final issue became, how can we get out quickly enough? As if withdrawing from a war unilaterally is a victory. We have to learn our lessons from these experiences because we need to come to a nonpartisan conception. The fundamental interests and purposes of a country cannot change every decade. We cannot afford having read studies of all our purposes every time a new administration comes in. And that's why institutions like this are so important. To help us find the right balance between our ideals and our necessities, to analyze where we are, to choose the means, to define purposes, that is to the great credit of this, ins of this institution. And nobody symbolizes it more than it's retiring chairman. Hank Greenberg and I have been friends for many decades. I used to say that he is bound to prevail because it is infinitely more painful to resist him 
than to do what he proposes. <laughs> and also, the least taxing job I've ever had was chairman of the advisory council of AIG because the chairman and I agreed on almost everything. So he didn't need uh, much of my advice. But Hank has been a steady supporter of a purposeful, strong, and compassionate America. He has been one of the pioneers of relations with China. A relationship which is crucial not only because of the significance of the two countries in material but because, uh, resources, but also because it is essential as a, 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 to enable us to avoid the tragedy that befell Europe when it slid step by step into a conflict. Hank has supported in New York so many worthwhile causes that I don't I want to enumerate them all here, from hospitals to study groups on a variety of subjects. Above all, he is a man to whom but could always go and say, here is a problem. And you did not have to ask him. Uh, he would then volunteer. Uh, he served on uh, Omaha Beach during uh, World War II, which those of you who remember that period, which can't be all that many, know was a bloody and brutal experience. He has learned from that that we should avoid war if we can honorably do so. But he's also learned that a strong America is essential for peace. And so he's been one of the strong supporters and the permanent inspiration of this institution. And on behalf of all of us, I want to thank him for what he has done. What I suspect he will still do and for the privilege of having been able to work with him and to observe how he has worked with others. So, thank you, Hank. And now, let me turn this platform over to our retiring chairman, who will never be retired in our hearts, Hank Greenberg.